from a principal standpoint, he would rather be humble and a less renowned person and go after slavery and after principle and after abolishment of slavery than it would be to put his, you know, ambitions first and to be famous and be a hero and be all of these things, but to basically put his policies and his views about slavery and, and otherwise uh, away or aside to be politically expedient. And he would not do that. He'd rather be humble and stay in this small band of, of legislature uh, folks, uh, if that be what it takes uh, in order to um, maintain his, uh, his principle. This is Henry Wilson expert Joe Weiss talking about Wilson's frequent switching of parties. First with the Whigs, then the Free Soilers, and as we'll discuss today, a new group of men, the Know Nothings. This is Henry Wilson and the Civil War. As Henry Wilson entered the new year in 1854, his political career was in shambles. He held no official position in government, he had just lost the gubernatorial election, and the coalition and constitutional convention he had worked so hard to build and maintain had collapsed. While all aspirations seemed to fade, an event in Congress would thrust Wilson back into the political spotlight. As America had been pushing west on the principle of manifest destiny, through the California gold rush and the capture of all of the newly acquired lands from the Mexican-American War, a way to quickly travel across the continent was needed. The dream of an intercontinental railroad occupied the busy work of Congress, which was divided into two factions, each wanting the railroad to take a different route. Northerners, of course, wanted the railroad to go across the north, while the southerners wanted just the opposite. Senator Stephen Douglas of Illinois, one of the key negotiators of the Compromise of 1850, devised a plan to route the railroad through Chicago, which made it so that the railroad would need to cross through the unorganized territory of Nebraska. While the South had little reason to support Douglas's plan, he found a sliver of hope in making a deal to appease both sides. On what that deal would be formed would be on slavery. As we've previously discussed, in 1820, Congress passed the Missouri Compromise, which prohibited slavery in the states north of the 36-30 parallel. Nebraska, the territory Douglas needed to organize, sat above that Missouri Compromise line. Douglas introduced his plan to curb the Missouri Compromise for a new state of Nebraska and allow for it to use popular sovereignty to decide whether it wanted to be slave or free. Though Douglas's plan was tempting, Southerners continued to resist, Douglas determined that the Missouri Compromise was less important to the future of the nation than a new railroad and told his Southern colleagues that his bill would repeal the entire act that prohibited slavery above the parallel. The Missouri Compromise was what many anti-slavery advocates viewed as the last check on the expansionist ambitions of the pro-slavery South. After a raucous debate, including prominent opposition from Senator Sumner, on May 30, 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska bill passed, doing away with the Missouri Compromise and reshaping the fate of the nation. Um, so in the winter of 1853-1854, Douglas introduced what becomes the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This is Professor Nicole Etchison, an expert on the history of Kansas. I'm Nicole Etchison. I am the Alexander M. Bracken Professor of History at Ball State University. You'll hear Professor Edgerson's voice throughout the next couple episodes as we discuss more about the ongoing affairs in Kansas. And in order to get Southerners to support the Kansas-Nebraska Act, uh, Douglas removes the prohibition on slavery and replaces it with popular sovereignty that whoever settles out there will get to vote to decide whether or not to have slavery. It makes Kansas-Nebraska very controversial, but it gets the Southern support 
and the legislation passes. When Wilson first heard of the Nebraska bill, he immediately got to work writing and delivering speeches to any audience open to listening. As 1854 progressed and the bill passed, Wilson increased his passionate dissent against the attack on anti-slavery laws. With Democrats taking charge in Congress to pass the bill, Wilson hoped to organize anti-slavery northern Whigs, free soilers, and northern anti-slavery Democrats into one party to fight the growing slave power. Around the same time, rumors began to arise that Wilson had secretly become affiliated with the newly formed Know Nothing Party, a group around the state who had capitalized and promoted anti-immigrant and anti-Catholic sentiments. The Know Nothings were at first a secret organization, though as their membership grew, they became more mainstream. In the months following the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, many Free Soil and Democrat coalitionists joined the Know Nothings as many affiliates held strong anti-slavery sentiments as well. As a result, Wilson got caught up in the fervor of the anti-slavery tactics and joined the party as yet another method to fight the slave power. In a letter written in 1855 by Illinois lawyer Abraham Lincoln, a man we'll be looking a lot more into in the coming episodes, Lincoln wrote, quote, I am not a know-nothing, that is certain. How could I be? How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? Our progress in degeneracy appears to me to be pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal, except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read, all men are created equal, except Negroes, and foreigners, and Catholics. When it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty. End quote. Though Wilson served as a respectable politician for the know-nothings to use to legitimize their organization, many know-nothings held critical views of the young politician because of his overly ambitious nature and his lack of passion for anti-immigrant causes. During the Constitutional Convention, which so many Irish and Catholic immigrants had opposed, which is what in part prompted many Free Soilers to jump to the Know Nothings, Wilson had always made it clear that the elements of the new amendments should represent all of the Commonwealth citizens, no matter their race or their nation of origin, though much of Wilson's pro-immigrant language would not make it to final proposals. Know Nothings criticized Wilson for speaking only on the moral causes of abolition, which had defined his career, rather than the xenophobic stances that define their party. Other notable abolitionists like Thaddeus Stevens, Nathaniel Banks, and Henry Winter Davis were also caught up in Know Nothing fervor. In 1854, the Know Nothings had an unprecedented victory, winning every single city and town and taking control of 362 of the 365 seats in the lower chamber of the State House. In June 1854, just a month after his supporting vote on the Nebraska Bill, Massachusetts Senator Edward Everett resigned his position. Following his vote, Everett faced hefty criticism from the passionately leaning anti-slavery state, and coupled with poor health, his time had come to depart from the Senate. This meant that when the Know Nothings took charge later in the year, a Senate seat was needed to be filled. Who would this newly formed and surprisingly successful group of men choose to fill one of the highest positions of power in the nation? Ambitious as always, Wilson closely admired the open seat, though his lack of passion for the Know Nothing cause dashed his hopes. Never one to give up because odds were not in his favor, Wilson pushed forward in his quest to build another coalition between the Free Soilers and Know Nothings to get him elected. Equal in his ambition to win a Senate seat was his ambition to break the slave power and fight for the anti-slavery forces in the Senate. A passionate and pragmatic abolitionist in the Senate, unlike Sumner, who was certainly passionate but not quite pragmatic, would greatly push the anti-slavery cause further. Though closely associated with the Know Nothings, Wilson also participated in the workings of a newly forming group formed on the basis of fighting the slave power, the Republican Party a group which we'll delve more deeply into soon. Passionate about abolitionist sentiments following the Nebraska Bill, at the Republican Convention in September, 
The anti-slavery party resoundingly nominated Wilson to be their nominee for governor, with Wilson receiving more than 65% of the votes. In October 1854, the Massachusetts Know-Nothings held their nomination convention for governor. Wilson, in attendance and prominent in his position and notoriety in the state, received 66 votes for governor. At some point following the vote, Wilson rose to speak and withdrew his name. By the fourth ballot, Henry J. Gardner clinched the nomination with 623 votes. Gardner, a former Whig, and Wilson, a free soiler, the two candidates shared some similar attributes, as well as some contrasting. Wilson was more passionately in favor of abolition, a plus for the growing anti-slavery sentiments in the state. Wilson was also endorsed by a pro-temperance group for his support of a proposed liquor law, a callback to Wilson's intemperate father during his childhood. Before Election Day 1854, Wilson and Gardner met and formed an agreement in which Wilson would withdraw his name from the race and wrangle his supporters to secure Gardner the governor's seat in exchange for Gardner to lead the know-nothings into supporting Wilson for the open Senate seat come the January election. With the know-nothings obliterating the other factions of the State House and effectively killing the Whig Party, Wilson became uneasy with his bargain. With all of this power, the know-nothings could elect whoever they wanted to fill the Senate seat. A coalition was not needed, as once thought. Would the nativist party follow the pattern of the Democrats and not hold true to their end of the deal, or would they prevail and elect Wilson as the senator? As the January election came around, questions of Wilson's true allegiance and ambitions began to surface. The coming days and weeks would be the time which would define his fate. No nothings questioned Wilson's allegiance to nativist principles, and as his prospects held by a thread, Wilson's election became of national interest. The New York Times reported on January 16th that, quote, much opposition is manifested to the nomination of Henry Wilson to the United States Senate, both in and out of the legislature. In the ward and town councils of the Know-Nothings, the subject has led to warm discussions and bitter personalities, and it is said that many of the prominent members of the order have withdrawn from it, in consequence from the difference of opinions, end quote. On the 20th, Wilson issued a statement in response to a question on his position and beliefs on the issues of the Know Nothing Party. Wilson, not fond of the nativist principles, issued his most anti-immigrant statement, though incredibly light compared to his Know Nothing counterparts. In his statement, Wilson wrote, quote, Summoned into action by the evils and abuses which have grown out of the annual immigration into America of hundreds of thousands of men, reared under the influences of social, religious, and political institutions differing from or antagonistic to our own, the American movement proposes to correct the evils and abuses by wise and humane legislation, to protect ourselves from the organized system in the old world, which subjects us to the support of foreign paupers and the depredators of alien criminals, to thoroughly revise the naturalization laws, to destroy the political element of foreign influence, heretofore so potent in public affairs, to counteract the insidious and malign tendencies of that sectarian power that instinctively sympathizes with oppression in the old world and in the new, and to place the government of America in the hands of Americans who are imbued with the spirit of her democratic institutions, guided in its action by love to all men and hatred for none." End quote. On January 23rd, the House quickly and overwhelmingly voted for Wilson to fill the vacated seat. With the House's votes now complete, the election moved to the Senate, where Henry Wilson's future would be decided. Rather than move in the speed and agreement that the House did, the Senate deferred and pushed their vote until the 31st, giving the anti-Wilson establishment even more time to launch their attacks. January 31st came around, and it was now time for the Senate to cast its ballots. In Cobbler in Congress, Wilson biographer John Abbott narrates the scene very nicely, so I'll now defer to his account. Quote, if he should lose his bid for a Senate seat, he would never have the chance to prove his opponents wrong. Now his whole career, his whole future, rested on the decision of the state's 40 senators. In the galleries of the upper house, a huge crowd watched as the voting began. 
Wilson needed 21 of the 40 votes of the Senate to obtain this coveted post. The crowd waited breathlessly as the president counted the ballots. Then he intoned the verdict. E.M. Wright, Wilson's chief opponent, had obtained 15 votes. Wilson, the required 31. Cannon boomed to announce the choice of a new senator. End quote. The 43-year-old man, who had grown up with nothing, spent most of his life in poverty, and never received a formal education, was headed to the nation's capital to join his friend and colleague Charles Sumner to fight for freedom and destroy the slave power that gripped the nation. When the results were announced, celebrations broke out in Natick. Friends, family, and honored guests held a celebration wishing their hometown hero congratulations. When one of the honored guests rose to speak and mentioned Wilson's humble beginnings, Wilson's father Winthrop rose and shouted, Screw him! What does he mean? I've got a good mind to get up and kick his ass. The crowd, including Wilson, burst into laughter. Wilson made his arrangements, bid farewell to his wife Harriet and son Henry Hamilton, and departed by train, making a journey to the U.S. Capitol to take his seat as the next senator of Massachusetts. Though Wilson's affiliation with the Know Nothings proved to be successful for his ascension to the Senate, it's still a blemish on his career. Wilson greatly sacrificed his morals to join a party whose discriminatory beliefs and attacks still penetrate factions of the American political psyche today. And to complicate things, at this time in the early 1850s, there was a strong natalist movement. Natalist movement. Uh, Wilson got involved with that. Uh, it's one of the parts of his career that many people do, are not proud of. Uh, he claimed that he got involved in that because it was a way to attack the, uh, the slavery movement. In the end, I guess he was right. Uh, but uh, he also uh, didn't uh, make himself a good name by being involved with the Know Nothing movement. Uh, the Know Nothings lasted about four or five years. It was a very strong movement in Massachusetts, and it took over the Massachusetts legislature for a time. Uh, but it, the nativist movement also helped get Wilson elected for the first time to the U.S. Senate. Uh, after that time, the nativist movement declined, and Wilson's subsequent elections to the Senate were all under the Republican Party. In defense of Wilson, almost every Massachusetts Know Nothing elected to Congress was an ardent abolitionist, and the Know Nothings never passed any anti-immigrant legislation in the State House, though they did actively fight to reform and amend the state constitution. When discussing uh, Wilson's switch to the Know Nothings, do you think that his joining of this group was done out of ambition to gain political power because of his political ambition, or do you think it was more to advance his cause of fighting for anti-slavery? Both. Uh, his subsequent record, or his record even before that, indicates very little interest in the nativist issues. Uh, I think he used the Know Nothing Party uh, to achieve the ends dealing with anti-slavery. On today's episode, we covered the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, the further breakup of the Democratic and Free Soil Coalition, the forming of the Know Nothing Party, Wilson's nomination for governor, and then his election to the United States Senate. First, a special thanks to Nicole Etchison for sharing her expertise on the Kansas-Nebraska Bill. You'll be hearing more of her voice in the coming episodes. Once again, thank you to Betty Coed for sharing her expertise on the United States Senate. I look forward to hearing more from her in future episodes as well. Thank you as always to Joe Weiss and Jack Myers for sharing their knowledge and insight on Henry Wilson. If you found today's episode interesting, I encourage you to subscribe or follow so you don't miss any new episodes. And if you're interested in seeing some pictures of Wilson's life and doing some more reading, check out henrywilsonhistory.com. 
If you have any questions or comments you'd like to share, please email them to henrywilsonpodcast at gmail.com, and I'll do my best to respond in a future episode. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to speaking with you next episode.